we're now going to move to our um, Q and A panel, and uh, unfortunately, we're a, we're a couple of panelists down today. Um, we uh, don't have Peter Haviland, and I I don't think we have Jean Marc Benoufo either. But uh, we will see. It may it may change as we uh, as we get going. But um, basically, everyone else you've heard from um, uh, in the videos uh, will be on the panel. Plus two additions, uh, Antoine Longjean, who is the Chief Innovation Officer for Mega International. Antoine has contributed to the foundation of the HOPEX Enterprise Architecture Toolset and is also involved in the in standard organizations such as the OMG and the Open Group and has been a, a long time contributor inside the Open Group. And also uh, another colleague of mine, Chris Ford, who is VP of Enterprise Architecture and General Manager for Asia Pacific for the Open Group. Chris has global responsibility for the enterprise architecture activities inside the Open Group, including the TOGAF standard and the Archimate modeling language. As an enterprise architect, Chris has held various leadership roles throughout his career, including implementing and managing EA practices, application development, information management, and techno technology operations teams. He is also the CEO of the Association of Enterprise Architects. So welcome to all our panelists. Um, we have a, a number of questions and uh, questions are still uh, still coming in. So um, we will we will uh, excuse me, we will start to get through them. So the first one, I think, um, Antoine, maybe I'll um, I'll come to you since we haven't heard from you yet. And that is um, can you say a little about what has changed in the standard um, since the draft version or the snapshot? Oh yeah, so the EOF is like any kind of agile endeavor, was kind of made by incremental and also feedback from um, the first delivery we had. So the idea, of course, this is why we have a kind of two steps to provide a first snapshot for having initial feedback on the foundations. And at that time, we had some of the main principles being set up, but other ideas or other connections between product architectures and operations were still in, up and running. And also, so there's this ability to have a two-phase uh, feedback from you, the community yourself, help us building, I would say, a more valid because experience to the community and also complete because made uh, incremental steps. And especially, essentially, those final items that uh, Frederick showed uh, on the connection between product architecture, strategy, and operation. And I think that were the most final phases we ended through. But clearly, I think, and also something we experienced also within the open group was uh, this two step validation process, not having a, a large validation of a very big document, but being able to have incremental validation with the, the market and the team. I think that was also uh, something key for the development of the uh, Agile Architecture Framework. Thank you, Antoine. Anyone else uh, on the panel want to add anything about uh, changes from the snapshot? Um, otherwise, we will move on to a question. I'm going to pick on the other person we haven't heard from yet, Chris. So, um, understandably, um, I said it. I said at the beginning that uh, the Open Group uh, uh, is known for enterprise architecture standards, and none more so than TOGAF. So. A couple of questions related to that, Chris. Um, uh, the first was, does this replace TOGAF? And the, and, uh, the second related question is, uh, what's the sort of intersection or how do the, uh, the OAA standard and TOGAF, then the TOGAF standard um, work together or, or uh, coexist? Okay, so the, uh, I mean, the, the very short and brief answer is, is that, that uh, OAA doesn't, in the open group's view, replace uh, TOGAF. Um, but it does come with a very specific viewpoint and community viewpoint about what agile architecture is. Um, so the intersection between these things, I'll just use, use an example. Um, over the years of development of, uh, of TOGAF through 8 to what now, 9.2, the, the, the standard has always mentioned that you need to be managing culture or taking into account culture and organization in the context of the enterprise architecture practice and, and, the, and the enterprise itself. But the way those things get implemented in a given enterprise 
vary a lot. And so it's very difficult for a particular framework to articulate the situations that exist for every single enterprise. But TOGAF was a little bit um, obscure about exactly how you would go about organizational design or cultural issues, things like that. Um, I would offer that the, uh, the uh, Open Agile Architecture Framework deals quite explicitly with how to uh, take into account those particular types of issues and the current best practice thinking about how to approach those problems and to consider how you might, as an architect, help your uh, entire organization or your ecosystem move through those issues with the context that's provided in the Agile Architecture Framework. So they are complementary, but uh, specifically community-oriented viewpoints on what enterprise architecture is today. You know, it's, it's clear that, that TOGAF has been used and is used in digital transformation contexts. You've only got to look at some of the work going on in the, uh, in the uh, Indian national government, which is TOGAF-based for their own digital transformation to see that. But the OAA is, is targeting a community and an audience of architects and other uh, folks undertaking digital transformation. And it's a, an expansion of the enterprise architecture portfolio for the open group. It's complementary, not a replacement. Right, yeah, as I mentioned the toolkit earlier, it's, you know, it's, a, it's uh, another approach um, that, that can be taken uh, for enterprise architecture. Does, does anyone else on the panel have a, have a comment on uh, how the two standards uh, play together? If not, we will move to a ever-growing list of questions. Okay, um, let's see. Um, question came in fairly early on. Um, is there a plan to add or extend the standard to address concerns of government where legal requirements are always important? It's not just about value-based metrics. Um, I guess a related question, a similar question is, is do you see the standard um, being, being uh, capable of being used in a government context too? Who would like to take that? Um, maybe I could try uh, to answer that one. Let's say that uh, uh, the OA uh, has been developed uh, uh, with various organizations, uh, which included banks. And as you know, uh, the banking industry is a heavily regulated industry. Uh, and uh, I think also Paddy mentioned uh, uh, the regulation issue in the healthcare industry that uh, he is working in. So uh, we have uh, taken uh, the dimension of uh, uh, compliance uh, very seriously. And I will not go into details on how we uh, uh, include it, but I think that if you refer to, to Paddy's talk, uh, he, he's uh, offering a, a less command and control way of getting things done and, and uh, uh, making sure that constraints are uh, followed. Uh, and I think that uh, these uh, can not only include uh, somehow business constraints or uh, technology constraints, but also compliance constraints. And I think that uh, it's a key uh, dimension for, for agility at scale, uh, because if you cannot to uh, move uh, from the old way of achieving compliance to a new way uh, that's compatible with, with, with speed, uh, then it means that uh, you are not going to benefit from the speed that is required for digital transformation. So that's very important to, to basically uh, do both. And I'm not from the government industry, and there may be some aspect 
uh, that are more difficult than in healthcare or banking, but uh, we would really welcome uh, people from uh, government to, to join our working group so we can add also that dimension uh, in, in the future release. That's a great point, Frederick. Thank you. Okay, so we, the, the, that question is about government. Uh, next question is about we could, governance. We could do something about it, yeah. Oh, of course, so, yes. Uh, please. Yeah, just sometimes there is a kind of a position between a, a commercial organization and government, and one is only value driven and the other one is not. But I think the government is also value driven. So experience of, you know, the e-government part is important endeavors also, and they mm. measure by the value that governments provide. Of course, the measure of the way the value is, is measured is different, but value driven is also applicable in, for government, basically. Yeah, that's a good point, Antoine. We would, we would hope that our governments are value driven to some degree, wouldn't we? Um, I'd like to think so. Um, thank you for that uh, addition. So next question is on governance. Um, agile architecture needs agile governance. Um, can you say something about how that's handled in the standard or are there any principles around governance um, in uh, an agile at scale world? Any volunteers for that one? Um, I'm happy to speak to that if you'd like, Steve. Perfect, Paddy. Thank you. So, I mean, I think from my perspective, there's certainly the, the, one of the key focuses there in, in terms of governance is, is the topic of guardrails that I alluded to in my, in my little segment. Um, and guardrails really, you know, are about that transposition of the governance into a statement of what people can and can't do as they proceed in an agile manner for the components they're responsible for. And I guess to me, that's the key to this, right? That that if, if, if you want the team to act in an agile manner, you need to create the space for them to do that. You don't want them to do things that are inherently problematic or, or, or conf, uh, conflict with uh, your constraints or, or your governance process, but you want to give them the space. And to me, that's, that's the, where the guardrails become that central point where you just get them in, get them wrapped around it and, and, um, and, and proceed on that basis. And I think that's the, the thing. And I think the other thing I would say about that as well is, you know, in the best possible sense of the word, if the team can be involved in the generation of those guardrails and own those statements themselves, rather than feeling that they're being sort of pushed down upon them, and um, that you know that further in, sort of in, in, in buys them into the process and makes them part of it, and um, so that they're not railing against the restriction, but rather to understand what's you know what's being achieved and what's it's there to do. Patty, thank you. And and there's a there's a related question. I'll, I'll see if anyone else has anything to to ask. But you 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 mentioned guardrails again. Um, the related question: Is there a relationship? Do you think between EA runways and guardrails, or are they interchangeable terms in the OAA? Can you touch on that again, Patty? Or is uh, I don't hear somebody else jumping in, so I'll uh, <laughs> I'll do my best. And um, I'm I'm not the world's. Um, I'm not. I didn't. I, I suppose I didn't arrive in my role from an EA background, so I'm not the world's greatest expert. So I'm I'm going to be careful. Um, yeah. I you know I think in one sense guardrails are whatever they need to be for your org, you know, and I think that's really important, right? Because what you need to do is find the statements that empower the people you work with to do what they need to do for you. And if, if that means that they're EA runways, well, then great. If that means they're not because they don't meet some of the criteria, well, then they're not. But, but what you want to do, and I guess to me, the whole you know, statement of Agile in, in this sense is about bringing something to your organization that allows it to act in an Agile manner and doing whatever it takes to make that happen. And sometimes that involves taking slightly pers odd perspectives on things and, and bringing them in in slightly odd ways. But that would be my viewpoint on it. I, I don't think there's a hard rule, but I think, you know, the guardrail should be whatever it needs to be for your org. Okay. And I, I would add that to, uh, if I hear correctly, runway, uh, mm. there might be a, a reference to the architectural runway concept from self. Mm -hmm. And in the uh, agile architecture, uh, standard, uh, we are not using the actual runway concept because we think it's a very fuzzy concept that may mean uh, many different things to different people. So we prefer to talk about intentional architecture. 
And, and to, to close on governance, uh, we have a, a, a building block uh, that talks about agile governance. So if you're interested uh, by, by that theme, uh, I would encourage to, to go and download the standard because I think it's now available uh, and look at that uh, chapter on agile governance. Right. Okay. Thank you, Frederick. Um, okay. So there are a number of questions that are uh, uh, around the role of software architecture. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, read the latest of those. Um, Agile for us means more responsibilities placed closer to or in software development teams. Does the OAA involve methods for architecture roles like software architecture? The AA uh, is not prescriptive uh, too much on roles because we think that in agile enterprises, uh, those roles are very contingent to, to the specific context of the enterprise. Uh, what I would say is that uh, in an agile world, uh, we are thinking uh, about uh, cross functional teams. Uh, so, which means that uh, if you take a feature team or a squad, uh, should not be composed only of uh, software people. It should also uh, be comprised of uh, uh, people of other discipline and in particular business discipline. So, from that standpoint, the software discipline of engineering is important. Uh, but it should not be seen in isolation from from the uh, way uh, it interacts with, with the other competency uh, of agile teams. Um, overall, we, we are looking for uh, a simpler way of looking at roles. And for instance, one of the uh, large enterprises which contributes to, to uh, completed to the OA, uh, now uh, has uh, reduced the number of roles to uh, enterprise architect, uh, full stack architect. So instead of having specialized architect roles, which are more competency, a data architect, an application architect, full stack architect, uh, and, and a solution architect. Uh, uh, by opposition to the enterprise architect, the social architect uh, having a, a sort of a smaller scope. But, but here you see that sometimes the role uh, are linked to, to the seniority, sometimes to the scope, to, to the type of work uh, they do. And we don't believe that by multiplying the, the type of actual role, uh, we are doing a, a good service to, uh, to, to architecture. Uh, and to the extreme, uh, I remember a, a talk from uh, a leader from a uh, large retail company uh, who said, well, uh, in my enterprise and, and in many uh, 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 large uh, uh, pure internet company, uh, you have no architect or you just have one architect and, and sometimes he, he is the leader of the enterprise. So, so here it's the other extreme. I don't think we, we go that far, but it's certainly uh, uh, advocating for a simplification of, of the type of rules. Thank you, Frederick. Thank you. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe the goal to add to it, the goal is to raise the enterprise skills level of architecture in all the stack in all the different disciplines of the enterprise. So it's a skill set that should be shared, as Frederick said, up down in the organization. It's not a, proper, right. a property of some specific people in the organization. Okay, thank you, Antoine. Um, now we have uh, a, a question uh, about, <coughs> about um, I'm sorry to go back to this, to this Paddy, but uh, there is interest in the inverse Conway, <laughs> Conway rule. Um, uh, can you can you emphasize the inverse bit? I think there are a couple of questions on that. Um, what do you mean by the inverse bit? I, I mean, you, you talked about what Conway's law was, but uh, can we have another run at that one? Of course, I, I should I should prefix before I start this bit that my colleague, another contribute, 
contributor to the OAA, refers to the inverse comma as his favorite wrestling move, which might help people as well. Um, anyway, um, so <clears throat> the inverse bit really refers to if we take Conway's law as a statement of fact effectively, we can invert it by deliberately designing an organization structure to influence an arg architecture. And that's what the inversion is really about. It's about saying, well, if this law exists, let's take it and turn it on its head for want of a phraseology at the beginning and design an organization structure so that it influences the architecture. And that's really what we're saying in terms of the inverse. Understood. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. So um, let's see now. There, there are some other questions coming in. Uh, it's kind of groups. I'm trying to hit the the, the popular topics most. Um, question about uh, about maturity. Um, the statement here is that that maturity seems anti agile, anti agile, depending on which side of the Atlantic you're on. Um, is that a, is that a statement you you agree with? Because it's uh, the OAA still still uh, uh, talks about maturity. Um, is maturity anti agile? It's a broad question. I I realise. That's okay. Do you want me to jump in there, Steve? Why not? Why not? You're on a roll, Paddy. I'm on a roll. Well, I'm not sure about that, but um, I think my answer would be. You know, I think there are some groups or organizations who, who treat Agile as a carte blanche. Um, as he says, butchering the French, poor Frederick's probably cringing down the phone, but um, to, to act with utter freedom, like right, to disregard, you know, doc documentation and other practices necessary to produce high quality outcome. And I guess, yes, if you, if you view Agile in that way, then any mention of maturity is, of course, the, the antithesis of that, it takes you the opposite direction. My answer would be nuanced, and I guess you, you can take the view that, you know, coming from a background of a very large organization, that's just the world I live in, which says there is some level of maturity and governance and good practice that is necessary to have successful Agile. And what's successful Agile? Well, I'm going to be blank in corporate and say, it's one that leads you to a project that makes money. Whether that money is paid by external customers, as it is in my case, to pay for the product, or whether it's internal customers deriving value for your business and ultimately making money out of it that way, success is measured that way, and it has to be first, because otherwise we're not in the commercial business. And if you define it that way, well, then my answer is successful agile does require governance, and it does require all of those things wrapped around it because that's what's going to drive that success and ensure it. You can be lucky and not have any governance and still be successful, but if you want reproducible success, then you need governance. Excellent answer. Thank you, Paddy. A anyone else want to uh, chip in on, uh, on the maturity question? Hearing none, I will move on. Um, question about uh, OAA and SAFE. Um, for an enterprise recently adopting SAFE and needing to mature rapidly, do we focus on SAFE first, Agile architecture first, both in parallel, or can I not use them together? Are they different? Are they different beasts? Um, maybe I can take yes. that. Um, first of all, <clears throat> uh, several of the enterprise we've been uh, working very closely with, uh, including uh, uh, internal DXC, uh, are deploying Ceph. Uh, so we have uh, an experience uh, using Ceph. Uh, we've designed uh, the uh, A uh, to be uh, uh, compatible and to complement Ceph. Actually, what happened uh, is quite interesting here because we've published the snapshot uh, about over a year ago, and that snapshot uh, was putting uh, emphasis on, on organizational agility, business agility, uh, and many themes uh, that, that we talked about today. And a few months later, uh, we had uh, uh, SEF version 5.0, uh, which included uh, many of the new concepts that we introduced to. So, 
because these things were done in parallel, uh, uh, that, that shows that, first of all, the industry is moving in direction that, that's consistent. Uh, and secondly, that uh, there is compatibility between the two. Uh, we really think that there are two aspects uh, where uh, the uh, agile architecture uh, is really uh, important uh, and complements uh, SEF very well. The first is that on the official side, uh, SEF proposes a dual official model. And we don't think that uh, one size fits all official model uh, works. So we prefer to define a way to craft a specific organization uh, that matches the specific circumstances of the enterprise at some point in time, and that would evolve uh, rather than um, uh, that uh, sort of pre-designed uh, dual uh, model. Uh, the, the second aspect, um, and probably it's the most important, is that uh, uh, those self-position artificial roles uh, within the, the framework uh, there is uh, uh, less uh, guidance on, on how you uh, architect uh, experience, how you architect products, how you architect uh, uh, operating models and, and the enterprise operations uh, in CEF. And these are important because if you want, for instance, to, to structure uh, 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 the, for instance, uh, a PI uh, a prime increment or an agile release trend, uh, you're better off if you've got a good vision of, of the actual of your experience products and, and operations and also uh, software. So we complement SEF uh, on that one. Uh, and uh, I was thinking because I attended uh, uh, a few weeks ago uh, self training that we delivered for for our people, and gave me uh, uh, quite a lot of ideas on on how to create uh, a specific uh, training uh, that would cover agile architecture and that we could. Uh, uh, run by the, the people who have already been uh, trained to, to SEF. So that, that's, that's certainly something that uh, would have a lot of appeal in the marketplace uh, because uh, SEF is probably the, the most uh, uh, used agile at scale framework uh, uh, in the market today. Thank you, Frederick. A anyone else want to comment on that? If not, then uh, we, we have similar discussion on the, different from Frederick, which is on the consulting side. We have a lot of questions about how to connect to a, in a repository environment to APIC and so on. And I think the work being done also in the uh, agile architecture framework on product architecture and operational architecture is a very good fit to help people organize that split to, to have the, the agile train to be well defined and well scoped. So, so we see these parts that we've been working on on the agile architecture framework have a very good complement to, to drive and shape uh, the, uh, the top level of, uh, of SAFE indeed. Yeah. Thanks, Antoine. Thank you very much. Um, so to take it up, uh, uh, take it up a, up a level uh, generally. A, a question I thought was uh, interesting myself was: was um, do we still need architects in the dual digital agile enterprise? Um, and if yes, how might the architecture roles evolve or develop? Anyone want to tackle that one? You want me to uh, jump I think in? We've all... Yeah, please do, um, Patty. Sure. So I, I guess I definitely see a role, um, and it's certainly you know in my experience, it's something that that's still required. I think there is a difference though, um, and I think um, it goes to a phrase that I think actually I mentioned in the video of continuous architectural refactoring. And I think you know from my perspective, the difference here is about not defining an architecture to be executed and letting that run but rather to define a, a, 
a best guess, perhaps, a, 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 an outline architecture with the guardrails and the other elements, allowing that to, to, to spread, but then, uh, you know, refactoring that when it becomes obvious or when the, uh, the situation changes or the, the requirements clarify themselves, and then stepping back in, refining the architecture, uh, refactoring it as necessary, restructuring, and then iterating on that. And I think from my perspective, you know, in a sense, it becomes one of iterative architecture rather than, you know, that that notion of stepping back and, and, and producing the architecture and then executing against it, it becomes much more iterative. And, and that is, you know, it's not different because in some senses, although you're doing it again and again, it's not that fundamentally what you're doing is any different. It, you, you probably make different trade-offs because you know you're going to come back down the road. But at the same time, I, I would argue that it is um, it is still very much the same discipline, just with that different perspective on it. And I guess the other thing, you know, and, and again, it, it's one that sometimes we get a bad rep for, is to make ourselves available to the team as experts. You know, it's not just about the documentation that we share or the vision that we share. Sometimes it's just about making our own expertise available to people so they can ask questions and inform their own decision making. And, and you become that sort of hopefully font of knowledge um, if it's successful in that way with the team. Right. Thanks, Patty. Any Anyone else on that uh, on that topic? OK, um, got a number of questions that relate to um, uh, we, we talked earlier, in fact, Chris, Chris took the question um, <clears throat> about the uh, how OAA, uh, the OAA standard and TOGAF standard might interplay together. But a number of questions around um, if if I'm starting out architecture in my organization, should I go to TOGA first? Should I go to OAA first? Uh, can I use Archimate, uh, another open standard of the open group, in, in an agile way? Um, uh, there, there's a lot of activity going on to try and address these things. Can you uh, talk to that a little, Chris? Sure. Um, I, I saw that. Uh, I'm having a little bit of difficulty uh, listening to the panelists and context switching to the channel, so I appreciate the uh, the call out there. Um, I, I would say that there are, if you're starting out on something, that is, let's say you're in a greenfield or a, a brownfield kind of environment from your architecture practice perspective, or you're contemplating getting your head around an agile or digital transformation, there's a couple of places to look. Um, there is a massive body of knowledge related to TOGAF, but the uh, document that deals with establishing and operating an enterprise architecture practice, a TOGAF series guide on that, um, is a good place to start. And then also an equally good place to start is the open agile architecture material that we're discussing here today. And I think that um, one of the interesting problems that we discussed in setting up this event was twofold. One, we're trying to present to you today, and if you haven't seen the material, uh, it's available online uh, for download of the, of the Agile Architecture Framework, uh, the Agile Architecture Standard. You, you, there's a lot there, but it's a fairly quick read, right? If you're coming at this from a TOGAF perspective, operating and managing a practice, that guide with actual agile context in it already has been available in the TOGAF body of knowledge for more than two years now. So sometimes things get a little bit lost in the volume of content available from the open group around enterprise architecture. But specifically to the question, <coughs> There are a couple of documents that would be very useful to dip your toes into. One we're discussing today, and the other one I mentioned that in the TOGAF body of knowledge, the TOGAF series guide on establishing and operating an EA practice based on a TOGAF, uh, uh, based on a TOGAF standard. Thanks, Chris. And there, there are some, uh, yes, yeah, some, some uh, various guides uh, underway in the uh, agile and digital space. Uh, around that type of series guides, but um, let's get back to to the OAA um, today. And uh, question question coming in here: If repetitive success for 
for enterprise architecture requires governance and agile is almost the opposite of maturity when compared with architecture once we need more once we need more requirements up front how does agile architecture handle this problem of of we know and there's a there was a related question about um, in a lot of organizations, there's a lot of agile projects that are going on in a pretty uncoordinated way and um, and uh, resulting in in a need to then look back and say, okay, well, how do we actually architect these these various things or how do we bring them all together? So I, I guess how does how does agile it's it's similar similar concept, I guess to uh, uh, to how is the role of the architect changing um, but um, you know, how does agile architecture handle this this issue of um, requirements up front um, and uh, and yet needing to do things in an agile way? Uh, I see two uh, two questions uh, here. I mean, first is the question of requirements, uh, and clearly uh, the agile architecture. Uh, shifts from a requirement-oriented approach to an outcome-oriented uh, approach. Uh, you can throw uh, a lot of features uh, uh, to create uh, a new product that you think will, will appeal the market. But if those features uh, do not solve your customer problem, do not bring value, uh, from a lean standpoint, it's somehow waste. Uh, so, to illustrate that, uh, I'm thinking uh, about uh, uh, a book that um, uh, Mr. Kagan, uh, who, who is a guru of product management in Silicon Valley, uh, said, uh, criticizing the product owner role uh, in the agile world. Uh, he, he wrote that those product owners are, are mostly uh, managing uh, uh, requirements and backlog of requirements, and that uh, it was not really uh, what a product manager should do, because a product manager should make sure that uh, value is delivered to the client, and, and not all requirements uh, deliver value. Uh, on, on the second aspect of the question, and probably it's a different question, is uh, if you have many agile teams that run in parallel, uh, those agile teams uh, could create a mess. So you you need to, to strike a balance uh, between the autonomy of those teams uh, and, and the fact that uh, they are going to pursue uh, common purposes, that they are going to be aligned. Uh, so in the uh, agile architecture, uh, we have a chapter on governance that uh, addresses uh, that issue and provides uh, guidance on how to, to achieve that alignment. Uh, that alignment is not going to be achieved uh, via a common and control style of culture, uh, but more via uh, the definition of objective and key result that clearly uh, gives a common purpose to teams, uh, then teams have the autonomy to uh, actually uh, achieve, uh, uh, deliver those objectives uh, with, with some autonomy. Uh, and that's the uh, first way to, to align them. The, the second aspect is that, uh, of course, you should pay a lot of attention on how you divide uh, enterprise into teams of teams and teams. And we talked at length about the inverse Conway maneuver. So the idea is that you start from uh, a, a good uh, uh, architecture uh, vision uh, and you align the way your team are structured uh, 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 along that vision, which defines your product architecture, your, your operations architecture. And by doing that, you reduce uh, the situation where two teams uh, are doing the same thing, or uh, you, you've got a, a blind spot where no team uh, is addressing an important issue. So by combining uh, a different way of governing and by aligning the team toward an intentional architecture, uh, 
you you can avoid the type of situation that, that uh, you are thinking about. And I could add an, an, another guidance is provided on this and the kind of category of teams. Like you have streamlined teams which are really guided towards products and also platform and competency teams which play a cross functional role. So there is also a proposal in a, in, in a kind of pattern of team organization that helps uh, uh, having kind of commonalities being managed by these different relationships between teams. So I, I, I encourage you to look at this in the framework. And I think, you know, if for, for those of us that have worked in teams of teams environments, one of the things that may not be explicitly obvious from what Frederick and Antoine are just talking about is that in, in, a, in an environment where you have the interaction between the teams occurring, th there's an accelerating effect that occurs where teams have focus in one area, the blind spot is suddenly apparent and you can flex the organization to deal with the blind spot. So the ability for an effective cross-functional governance model to accelerate the value delivery, not everything has to rely on a single team or a command and control structure to accelerate that delivery. The flexibility of the organization to respond to the blind spots and the issues is extremely powerful. And I think that that may in part be what Patty was referring to earlier about the organization's ability to deliver. There's this accelerating factor in a team's environment that's managed in a more flexible manner. Of course, it needs guidance, it needs all of those things, but architecture definitely plays a role in that kind of operating model. Right, thank you, Chris. Anything else on that? Trigger a few few good comments. Okay, uh, question on operating models. Um, the strategy architecture DevOps or Star DevOps model is extremely useful for organization design and functioning. Any comments on that in relation to the OAA or response on operating models? And it's specifically at the end of the question, as opposed to biz DevOps. This is Star DevOps, strategy architecture DevOps. I'm afraid I'm not familiar with the um, the material they're referring to. I'm sorry. No, I think that's a, that's a, that's one that may have us uh, may have us flummoxed there. Um, okay, we'll move on. Sorry about that, um, but uh, I think. Uh, let's see, we can go to, um, do you have, a, can you share an opinion or any experience of using uh, open agile architecture or those similar approaches in either a small retail business or a large um, organization, specifically oil, oil and gas industry where safety is very important? So anything relating to a small retail business or oil and gas uh, specifically, or I guess any industry where safety is, uh, is and, and regulations are, uh, are particularly important. Maybe I can take uh, the, sure. the safety part. Uh, uh, at the core of, of the uh, way, uh, lean thinking uh, plays uh, uh, a big role. And uh, lean is not a set of tools and methods. It's also a culture. Uh, it's a management model. And in a, uh, in a lean culture, uh, respect of the individual, trust, uh, uh, talking uh, openly about the problems uh, is very important. And if you look at the, the safety culture on the other side, uh, safety relies uh, also on, on values that are uh, fairly similar. Uh, because in organization where uh, you cannot talk openly and freely about problems, where uh, when there is a problem, blame 
is the answer. Uh, those type of organization are not going to be capable of uh, handling the security dimension the, the right way. Uh, and to um, uh, illustrate that, uh, I, I would really recommend, if it's still available on the internet, uh, uh, that uh, you look at uh, an interview that the IT Revolution uh, website, uh, Jim Kim, uh, has recorded, where he, he put in the same panel, people from the lean culture with people from the safety culture. And it was extremely uh, interesting to see how uh, those uh, two cultures uh, would complement or, or differ uh, from each other. So, so definitely uh, the OA, by its lean roots, uh, I think is perfectly uh, compatible with, with uh, uh, and around with safety. On the other hand, it does not include some specific safety body of knowledge. And I'm thinking uh, about uh, methods, approaches that have been developed uh, uh, by the MIT, uh, but they are uh, really complementary. So there is, uh, uh, it's not difficult to to complement the OF. Uh, with, with those uh, safety approach. And in the in the course of developing the uh, OF, is also been in, in connections with the large organization building in the aircraft industry. And clearly they were having that change to traditional command and control to build the aircraft to a new agile organization, exactly as Frederick said, trying to share the problems that they face when they build this new kind of aircraft. And clearly the organization culture changed was a, a very big endeavor, wasn't it, Frederick? Yes. And, <laughs> but indeed, and, and uh, it was, so I think they were not mature enough to publish all together with us the, the, the way they are, but they had a one billion project to, to, to ensure this transformation within this big organization. And what key topic I remember was the way they did distribute responsibilities. And because in fact, when you build a different part of the aircraft, usually the, the, the chief engineer of part of the aircraft was responsible legally against, uh, uh, you could have a good on trial when there was a problem. And the change in mind was to share not per part of the aircraft, but across the whole aircraft altogether. And it was changing the responsibility and even the earning of people being in charge of the various parts. And the change in the organization was absolutely key. And it was a big transformation endeavor. So clearly, the, the team approach, the agile approach we promoted together, was a good input for them. So yes, indeed, it was not in the oil and, uh, but it was clean in the aircraft industry. And they, we were happy to see they were facing the same concerns and the, the principles that we share in the in the book, also with the DP book, uh, was the ones they were trying to build on. Indeed. Thanks, Antoine. Thank you. Um, there were there were a, a couple of couple of questions about uh, specific topics. Are there going to be specific topics, or uh, as as we call them in the the OAA context, playbooks? Um, Andrew, you you answered in the uh, in the Q and A panel that there will be um, a security playbook. Um, uh, there was a question about will there be a governance playbook? Are you able to uh, say anything or um, about uh, uh, specific? Uh, uh, playbooks that are under development. I think there's uh, there's a couple. In fact, Frederick probably knows them more than me. There was uh, uh, security was quite well progressed. Uh, meta model. Uh, what were the other ones, Frederick? Can you remember? I I'm drawing a blank. There were about two or three. So we we talked about modernization uh, and uh, uh, but, but here one of the. Uh, the way we approach that development is to make sure that we had at least one, but preferably several contributors who have a real world experience in some enterprise and who could devote enough time to, to write uh, content. Uh, so really, we are driven by uh, identifying uh, those people uh, who are willing to to spend uh, the time sharing the, their expertise. So if we get those people, the, then uh, we will get new material. If we don't get 
uh, enough time from those people in some area, uh, it will be slower. And for governance, uh, we have an, an agile governance chapter. So it's already uh, in the uh, way uh, standard has published uh, today. Yeah, I just looked up the other book that was a possible, as you say, it relies on contributors, is the cloud. There was a cloud playbook as well. Yes. Right. Yeah. And that's a great point that you make there, Frederick uh, and Andrew. It is, a, it is about contributors. So where there are, if there are areas of particular interest to you, then the, uh, the way to get those worked on um, inside the open group is to, uh, is to get involved. Um, we'd love to have you. Um, one last question before we, uh, we wrap up, folks. Um, uh, interesting way it's put, I guess. Can we understand the OAA standard as a way of incremental building of software product lines plus user experience so services can be selected? So is it is it a way of uh, is it a way of approaching and building up those those product lines plus the oh, excuse me use experience not user experience so services can be selected it relates to a, a another question which was about a, a, a the, the role of services um, going forward and how it how it relates to that is that a, a way that you would want the standard to look at after your hours of contribution to it folks. Um, I guess I'll jump in again. Um, so I, I think from from my perspective, Steve, you could certainly look at it that way. I, I have certainly no objection to anybody looking at it that way or using it in that light. Um, I think, um, you know, there's some interesting questions there about how those criteria for service selection come into being. And I think, yes, I'd love to say, you know, taking an agile approach to that saying, here's our initial set of criteria, let's use it, let's validate our experience with it, be that with, you know, real use or, or through a testing process or whatever, and then inform that and go forward, absolutely. Is that really what we've written? Probably not quite so much, but it's certainly in there, certainly something I would happily encourage. I don't know if the others have any additional. Thanks, Patty. Any other last comments on that uh, or anything else from the from the panelists? If not, then it, I'd just like to thank uh, all of our panelists for their efforts with uh, with the videos ahead of time and for taking the questions today and um, for all your efforts to uh, to help develop this standard um, and uh, that we're, that we're proud to launch today. So thank you all very much to the panelists and obviously um, to all our participants today. We've had some great numbers of people on uh, on here today. Um, hopefully you've uh, got much more of an understanding or a flavor of, of uh, the Open Agile uh, architecture standard. And uh, please do go and look at it. The link to it was in the chat channel um, but uh, you'll you'll also I think it was also in um, in uh, what Chris showed um, as well. So uh, or Andrew actually Andrew um, Andrew's video there's a specific link, but we can certainly put the link in now uh, in the chat channel, and we will leave the chat channel open for just a few minutes after the uh, after the event actually concludes, just in case you want to uh, uh, share any. Um, uh, any comments with each other or or just uh, it's the closest thing we get to networking with a virtual event at this uh, of this type but thank you all for for attending um please go and uh, download download the standard we hope it's uh, of use to you in your day job as i said at the beginning and um thank you all for joining today and look out for more about this um uh, and other things in this space from the open group in the near future Thank you and uh, have a good rest of the day, uh, evening, whatever it is, wherever you are. Be safe.